hello ladies and gentlemen more than two and a half years. Uh, the stage is back to uh, Hester yourself. Please, let's start. Great, thank you. It's, it's such an honor to be part of today's conference. I'll begin with my standard disclaimer, of course, which is that the views that I represent are my own views and not necessarily those of the Securities and Exchange Commission or my fellow commissioners. Talking about government money may not be the best way to start remarks at a blockchain um, conference, but that's exactly where I'm going to start. In 2017, the UK began issuing a plastic 10 pound note with an image of author Jane Austen on the back. The Bank of England's website explained that she, quote, provided astute insights into 19th century life, often praising the virtues of reason and intelligence and highlighting some of the barriers that society erected against the progression of women. The United States also is readying a new bill featuring a prominent establishment challenging woman Harriet Tubman, um, she'll soon grace our $20 bill. She was born several years after Jane Austen died, and she too took a stand against barriers 19th century America, uh, American society erected against the progression of black Americans and women. Um, and she was a literal and not mere, merely literary uh, uh, um, advocate for, for rights, um, though she was a noted speaker. She brought herself and many other enslaved Americans to freedom through a remarkable combination of intelligence, courage, faith, boldness, diverse expertise, fearlessness, hard-won experience, physical strength, resilience, and cooperate, cooperation with others active in the abolitionist movement. These traits and experiences later equipped her to serve in the Civil War as a scout, nurse, cook, and even military expedition leader. Tubman's commitment to liberty wasn't an abstract commitment, but it was personal and life-changing to each of the individuals whom she led on a grueling march to freedom. It's going to be wonderful to have Harriet Tubman's likeness on the paper money in our pockets. But individual liberty, um, something to which she was so deeply committed, also is being memorialized in non-sovereign money. Ms. Tubman died almost 100 years before Bitcoin's birth, but it is an interesting thought experiment to think, had it been around um, when she was alive, how it might have affected um, her, how might it, it have benefited her and others in similar life and liberty threatening situations. Getting money quickly was often a matter of life or death for the people whom Tubman was trying to save or support. Moving money around was difficult, expensive and risky. Tubman was often, often traveling back to the eastern shore of Maryland um, to liberate more people, to Canada, to visit family and friends. She had helped to freedom around the Northeast to raise money to fund living expenses, um, future trips and humanitarian relief efforts, or to the South to help with war efforts. People, some of them overseas, sent money to friends they thought she was going to visit on these travels. There were delays and risks associated with transmitting money in the 19th century, including risks of money not reaching its intended recipient because it was lost or stolen along the way. Getting money to her family and friends back in Maryland was probably difficult, impossible, or maybe even illegal. Carrying a lot of money around was risky. A peer-to-peer -peer tool that enabled easy to store money to reach people almost instantaneous, instantaneously where they were without having to pass through the hands of an untrustworthy or expensive intermediary could have been helpful. It's common to hear government officials worrying about cryptos used by criminals, even though the numbers suggest that Bitcoin at least is used for illicit purposes less often than cash is. Um, perhaps government officials should pause to consider the flip side of crypto, its value in protecting people from illicit activity. Because of its ability to reach people without intermediaries and its ease of storage, transport, and access, crypto can be an important part of the survival story of people living under the threat of harm by their families, people in their communities, or repressive governments. 
The excessive focus on illicit uses and the underestimation of the protective uses of crypto is one example of how evidence-based rulemaking is not yet the norm in crypto regulation. We can do better, and I hope that this year will mark a turning point for the United States, which in turn may spur other countries similarly to take a more sensible approach to crypto regulation. The SEC faces several challenges and corresponding opportunities in regulating blockchain-based assets and technologies. While the specifics won't be the same for other jurisdictions, some of the general regulatory principles likely are applicable despite jurisdictional differences. To start, remembering first principles can help us to focus our efforts on the appropriate objectives. The role of, the role of government should be to serve people, not to surveil and curtail people's everyday activities. Of course, government has a role, um, and an important one, in setting regulatory guardrails to ensure that people don't harm one another. But these guardrails should support people's ability to exercise their liberty in a way that serves them, their families, and their communities. To the extent crypto and decentralizing technologies allow people to do these things without harming others, we as regulators should work so that they have the freedom to experiment with these technologies. Many experiments, of course, with any new technology will fail, but those failures can help point the way to future successes. So broad room for experimentation with appropriate protective measures to reduce and mitigate harm is paramount. Experimentation can teach both regulators and market participants important lessons. Recently, the SEC initiated a pilot program that seeks to facilitate innovation with respect to digital asset securities. For a period of five years, a broker dealer operating under specified conditions, including limiting its business to digital asset securities, will be able to take physical possession or control of customer digital asset securities for purposes of Rule 15C3, which is our customer protection rule under the Exchange Act. Along with providing this relief, we asked a number of questions, quote, to gain additional insights into the evolving standards and best practices with respect to custody of digital asset securities. This experiment is limited because of the differences between the way digital asset securities and traditional securities are issued, held, and transferred, and the unique challenges in demonstrating control over digital asset securities. Some of the conditions on the relief are relatively straightforward and should not be too burdensome. For example, the broker dealer would have, would have to assess the characteristics of a digital asset securities distributed ledger technology and associated network, have policies for establishing exclusive control over the digital asset securities, and have a plan for safeguarding the digital asset securities in the event of the broker dealer's liquidation. Other limitations perhaps are less workable. Um, participating broker dealers, for example, can't hold digital assets unless they're securities, which means that people can't pay for the digital asset securities with stable coins, Bitcoin, Ether, or some other cryptocurrency. We have gotten some early feedback in response to the re request for comments that accompanied the announcement of the pilot program. I hope we'll get more so that we can craft a workable, long-term way for broker dealers to interact with digital assets. While regulators need to understand and scrutinize new asset classes and technologies, um, we do need to guard against excessive conservatism because that can impede competition, distort the market, and harm investors. The SEC, for example, has hesitated to green light investment products that incorporate crypto, um, especially the, the requests we've gotten so far have been related to Bitcoin, um, but certainly this applies to other cryptocurrencies as well. This approach is inconsistent with our limited role as a disclosure regulator. We are not supposed to be an interventionist merit regulator. Although well-intentioned, our wariness with regard to crypto deprives investors of access to products and services that they want. Moreover, caution-motivated delay makes it more difficult for us to change course should we decide to do that. If we've said no to one product sponsor, how can we say yes to another seeking to offer a similar product? Meanwhile, the market engineers around our denials by creating substitutes that don't require SEC approval. The example of this phenomenon about which I'm most often asked is the Bitcoin exchange traded product. To date, the SEC hasn't approved an ETP 
although a growing list of sponsors has sought approval. As noted in my statements following the disapproval of those requests, rather than applying the fairly straightforward standard that we've typically applied when we've looked at other ETP filings, including filings for precious metals like palladium and platinum, we've insisted on increasingly sophisticated analyses of the relationship between the underlying spot market and the futures market to determine the susceptibility of, the, of these markets to fraud and manipulation. Not only is it unclear whether prior non-crypto ETP filings could have passed muster under this more rigorous approach, the ever-shifting goal, goalposts are unfair to innovators who spend ever-increasing amounts of money on attorneys and quantitative experts only to find that they failed to hit, hit a target that has moved once again. Will we now apply those same standards to other types of ETPs also? In the meantime, investors looking for crypto exposure have gotten creative. They've invested in other securities products with crypto underliers that trade over the counter and on non-US exchanges and perhaps even in the stock of public companies that hold Bitcoin or engage in Bitcoin related business activities. The problem, however, is broader than exchange traded products devoted exclusively to Bitcoin. In addition to repeatedly rejecting applications to list and trade ETPs focused on Bitcoin or Bitcoin futures, the agency also, through less formal mechanisms, has stymied attempts by investment companies subject to our Investment Company Act of 1940, um, that's mutual funds, exchange traded funds. We've stymied their, their efforts to invest substantially in these assets. A January 2018 SEC staff letter explained why cryptocurrencies are, quote, unlike the types of investments that registered funds currently hold in substantial amounts, and laid out a number of significant investor protection issues, including valuation, liquidity, liquidity custody, arbitrage, and manipulation that need to be examined before sponsors can begin offering these funds to retail investors. The letter warned that it was not quote, appropriate for fund sponsors to initiate registration of funds that invest substantially in cryptocurrency and related products, that existing registration statements for such product products should be withdrawn, and that if a sponsor were to register such a fund, the staff would, quote, view that action unfavorably and would consider actions necessary or appropriate to protect Main Street investors, including recommending a stop order to the commission. The division invited people to weigh in on those issues, an invitation incidentally to which a few people have responded. Three years later, the commission has done nothing to resolve the legal and practical ambiguity around whether and in what amount it will allow investment company act, it will allow investment company act funds like mutual funds and ETFs to hold crypto or crypto futures. The SEC's reluctance to permit traditional investment vehicles to hold Bitcoin or Bitcoin futures has contributed to investors seeking more expensive, less convenient, or less direct substitutes, but it's also heightened the stakes of any regulatory approval for a mainstream retail product we might one day grant. By waiting, we have magnified the first <clears throat> approved advantage in the Bitcoin exchange traded product or registered fund space. Moreover, we've comported, because we've acted like um, merit regulators, investors might view any approvals as an official blessing by the commission <clears throat> about the quality of the products we approve. That would be the wrong inference to draw. Investors alone, um, or with the help of their investment professionals, need to think carefully about whether any particular security, crypto-based or not, is right for them. Regulators should commit themselves to providing clarity so that traditional financial market participants can engage with crypto with confidence that they're complying with their regulatory obligations. Other regulators in the US have been proactive about providing such clarity to their regulated institutions. For example, under the eye of our sister regulator, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, a healthy Bitcoin futures market has developed and an ether-based futures market recently initiated trading. Another federal financial regulator, the OCC, which is a national bank regulator, has opened the door for banks and thrifts that it supervises to participate in independent node verification networks and use stable coins for payment activities. SEC staff has issued guidance, including most recently, a risk alert from our division of examinations designed to help investment advisors, broker dealers, transfer agents, 
and exchanges craft policies and procedures for digital asset securities. We do need to do more, and I look forward to working to provide that clarity with Gary Gensler, who is likely to get confirmed um, relatively soon as the next chairman of the SEC. One important area in need of clarity is custody. Consider the staff's recently issued response to the state of Wyoming's determination that a particular Wyoming chartered public trust company approved to provide custodial services for digital and traditional assets under Wyoming law is a qualified custodian under the Investment Advisors Act and the SEC's custody rule. This classification matters because registered investment, advisor investment advisors generally have to use a qualified custodian to safeguard their clients' assets. The staff's letter made clear that the SEC is, quote, not bound by statements or views expressed by state regulators, including statements or interpretations regarding custody of digital assets, as well as more traditional securities, and whether any entity is a qualified custodian. The staff's letter then proceeds to ask a series of questions, including whether state chartered trust companies possess characteristics similar to those of the types of financial institutions the commission um, identified as qualified custodians, and whether there are entities that currently satisfy the definition of qualified custodian under the custody rule that shouldn't be included within that definition because they don't meet the policy goals of the rule. This response not only fails to provide clarity for investment advisors seeking to find a qualified custodian for crypto, but it also introduces new ambiguity about when a state regulated financial institution can serve as a qualified custodian for any kind of asset. To assess whether a state supervised and examined trust company or bank is a qualified custodian, the statutory and regulatory te text should be our, um, our governor. Together, they state that if a substantial portion of the business um, of that trust company or bank consists of exercising fiduciary powers similar to those permitted to national banks, then that entity can serve as a qualified custodian. That's a pretty straightforward, albeit fact-dependent, um, approach. As one commenter to the staff's letter responded, if Congress had not intended state chartered entities to be treated on par with, with national banks, it wouldn't have specifically included both state banks and state trust companies in the definition of bank in the Advisors Act. Rather than raising fundamental questions about custody under the Advisors Act in the crypto context, the SEC should assist advisors in navigating custody in the crypto context and save those larger questions for a more holistic review of the custody rule. Meanwhile, tailored relief with respect to crypto custody might be appropriate. One firm has called for no action relief permitting self-custody given that, quote, maintaining digital assets with a third party custodian may not, at least in the current state of the market, be the most effective means for an advisor to discharge its fiduciary duty to safeguard client assets and put client interests first, and may even give rise to adverse collateral consequences for network developments critical to preserving the value of a client's holdings of digital assets. A talk about crypto regulation in the United States wouldn't be complete without a mention of one of the main questions posed to the SEC, when is a digital asset a security? Despite the frequency with which we get this question, um, clear answers are quite rare. One reason for the persistent ambiguity is the breadth of our security um, definition under, under our statutes. People planning to distribute digital assets have to determine whether the federal securities laws apply to those dis distributions. The SEC staff has provided guidance to help people make these determinations, but the guidance is really difficult to apply. It lists numerous factors designed to assess whether so-called active participants provide essential managerial efforts, whether the token purchasers expect to make a profit, and whether the purchasers are buying um, the tokens to use for a purpose. Supplementing the staff um, guidance, we've settled a number of investment, uh, a number of enforcement actions. Um, there have also been some cases that have been litigated and their judicial opinions, but neither complex staff guidance nor enforcement actions are a satisfactory way to guide people who want to comply with the law. Um, but they're unsure how to do so. Accordingly, I look forward to working with our incoming chairman 
on a safe harbor along the lines that I've proposed or some other commission level regulatory guidance. The crypto asset class and the industry that has grown up around it have developed very quickly. Bitcoin was first mined in January 2009, and as of yesterday, its price was just over $60,000. In the meantime, other projects such as Ethereum and Polkadot have emerged with their own native tokens and vibrant communities growing around them. The growth to date has challenged us regulators, but bigger challenges lie ahead. The pressure on us to grapple with the difficult questions through rulemaking and guidance will intensify rapidly along with institutional interest in crypto. Legacy financial institutions and traditional investors that have sat on the sidelines so far are likely to push us to allow them to play a more active role in facilitating crypto trading and investing for their clients or investing themselves. Meanwhile, some crypto native firms are now large companies that are woven into the fabric of the broader economy and so also will command more regulatory attention. A final regulatory lesson then is that the regulatory work is only just beginning. Thank you for the chance to join you for this conference. Of course, I would have preferred to be with you all in person, but we can celebrate the technology that allows us to do this remotely. And um, it frankly facilitates international collaborations that would have been unthinkable in the time of Tubman and Austin. As regulators seek to build frameworks that facilitate people's ability to use technology, including blockchain technology, to engage freely with one another, competition from and cooperation with other regulators can be a healthy way of spurring us all to do a better job. We have much to learn from one another, but I'm really looking forward to continuing the work with friends and colleagues from all across the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, Commissioner Hester Pierce, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the British Blockchain Association, we thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, all the participants of uh, British Blockchain Association. I, I know you had a very long day today. Uh, we thank you very much again uh, for spending so much time with us. Uh, it was a very constructive day, uh, very nice to hear new ideas, new knowledge sharing. And we look forward to all of you in our uh, next uh, scientific conference next year, the information of which uh, will be shared to you in uh, in coming days and months. Uh, and all the best to all of you, and you all have a, a nice evening. And here we conclude our uh, 2021 uh, ISC conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.